person? Should we hold that person responsible for what they've done when they just didn't know otherwise? Um, I found that this question actually came up a lot in the last few months in conversations about COVID, where there were individuals or communities who weren't following the guidelines, possibly because of misinformation or because of lack of information. And what do we do with that? How do we relate to people in that situation? Um, I think that as we'll see today, the question also applies in like so many other cases. Now, I guess there are a lot of different kinds of ignorance, but for the purpose of this class, I'm going to posit that there are two kinds of ignorance. There's ignorance of when it comes to ignorant, two kinds of ignorance when it comes to breaking the law. Um, and those two kinds of ignorance are ignorance of the law and ignorance of the facts. Um, when it comes to ignorance of the law, that's one that like already has been discussed in the ancient world. Aristotle already talks about like how really we should be able to assume that everybody knows the law. And like if someone doesn't know the law, we can't let them off the hook because of their ignorance. Um, so that's something that, that's, you know, kind of a long standing tradition. Uh, although we'll see today that maybe sometimes there are people who have a good excuse for their ignorance. And what do we do? with those people. Um, okay, so we're going to start with, um, we're going to start with that. And I'm going to just put up the, um, the source sheet in share screen and we'll take a look at a little passage there. Um, one sec. Okay, um, so this is a passage from Tractate Shabbat. And Tractate Shabbat, as you may guess, is about Shabbat. Um, and this particular section is about what happens when somebody forgets um, about Shabbat, right? It is Shabbat, and I just, I forget that it's Shabbat, and I do something that is a Shabbat violation. Now, normally the rule is that in that case, according to Talmudic law, um, someone who forgets about Shabbat has to uh, bring a sin offering for having done an accidental transgression. Um, but now they have a case, they bring a case that's not a regular case of somebody forgetting about Shabbat. So I'm going to read, this is just source number one over in the source sheet. Rav and Shmuel both said, a child who was taken captive among the Gentiles and a convert who converted among the Gentiles have the same, same legal status as one who knew of Shabbat and ultimately forgot and are liable. So let's imagine the scenario here. You have somebody who decided to become Jewish but didn't really know what being Jewish was like. They're living in a completely Gentile environment and they decide to join the Jewish people or maybe they even are somebody who comes from a Jewish community but as a small child they're taken away from that community. This sounds like a, stuff, like a really great Jewish novel um, and they're taken away from the Jewish community. They're living completely separate from the Jewish community and they just don't don't know what Jewish life is like. And so what do we do with that person? That person then comes back to the Jewish community and they just don't know about Shabbat. They just never heard of it. So do we treat that person who just showed up in the Jewish community, do we treat them the same as like me when I happen to like slip my mind on Shabbat and I forget that Shabbat, is that the same thing? My forgetting, is that the same as their complete ignorance? Um, so Rav and Shmuel say that it's the same, that if they never knew about Shabbat, then they have to bring the sin offering, just like me when I forget about Shabbat, it's the same thing. Um, but then we have a second opinion, Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish both said that is specifically if he knew of Shabbat and ultimately forgot. However, a child who was in captive about the Gentiles and a convert who converted among the Gentiles are exempt. Okay, so um, this is a person who really had no access to information. And there are two opinions. One is to hold him responsible anyway, but the other is to cut him a break because it's totally out of his control. Now, I want to ask you a question about this debate. This was a debate about somebody who doesn't know about Shabbat. I wonder what you think would be the case if this debate were not about somebody who doesn't know about Shabbat, but let's say someone who grows up, I don't know, among 
I don't know who, and doesn't know that you're not allowed to punch someone in the face. Um, let's imagine that this person just grows up and was never taught that you weren't supposed to punch someone in the face, and then one day they punch someone in the face. Would we be as forgiving of that person? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts in chat, um, whether you think that yes, we would forgive that person if they were never taught not to punch someone in the face, or whether you think that we'd hold them to a different standard than the person who just never knew that, um, that you're supposed to keep Shabbat. Um, so just, just put, your, put your thoughts, um, could, if anybody could just share their thoughts in chat. Okay. All right. Um, so a couple things. Somebody said, yes, we have to forgive them and we have to teach them. But now I have a couple of interesting distinctions here. Um, Barry said, punching is harmful and that is something they should know. Meaning maybe there's like two, I think there are two things actually from what Barry wrote. One of them is that um, it's maybe there's like a certain kind of like natural law that maybe like we don't think it's okay to not know. That like maybe really everybody has to know it. And the other thing that he said is that it's harmful. Objectively speaking, if this person who never learned that you can't punch someone in the face punched me in the face, I have a bloody nose now and it doesn't really matter to me that he didn't know my nose is still bleeding. Um, a couple more, I just want to read what people wrote here. Punching someone, oh, should be wrong instinctively. Also, Holly said that. Um, physical violence is different than the learned behavior of Shabbat observance. Oh, they know it hurts and they should know they shouldn't hurt anyone, meaning that they can kind of infer it. Even if nobody ever taught you that punching someone in the nose is wrong, maybe you could figure it out actually on your own. Um, Okay, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Like Perry said, actually would apply, I think, equally to Shabbat and to punching someone in the face. But I think that some of these other things actually draw some interesting distinctions. And that when you cause someone harm, that's different uh, from, right? If Shabbat is maybe an affront to God, but God, you know, maybe God doesn't mind if you didn't know better. Um, but, um, but these other things, like once my nose is already bleeding, maybe that's just a different category. Okay, all right. So now I want to look at a second form of ignorance that I think is actually much trickier, and that is ignorance of the facts. Just not properly assessing the situation in front of you. And here I want to start with a Bible story um, about Abraham. Abraham. Um, Abraham journeyed from there to the region of the Negev, I'm reading from source number two on the sheet, and settled between Kadesh and Shur. While he was sojourning in Gerar, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. So King Abimelech of Gerar had Sarah brought to him. Okay. So let's get the picture. Abraham and Sarah, and we're told elsewhere that Sarah is very pretty, um, are traveling. And Abraham tells everybody that Sarah is in fact not his wife, but his sister. Um, as we know from the previous time that there was an incident like this in the Bible, there is a concern that when a king sees a pretty woman, he grabs her for himself. And then if there's a husband, he kind of finds a way to have the husband um, eliminated from the picture. And so in order to save his own life, Abraham feels that it is safer to say that Sarah is his sister so that if she gets taken, he won't get killed. Um, so that's, that's the background that we know from elsewhere. So he tells this, this lie um, about Sarah, and in fact, Sarah is taken to the king. Continuing in the story, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, you are to die because of the woman that you have taken, for she is a married woman. Right, that you're about to commit adultery, he says to the king, because you just grabbed a married woman and brought her to yourself, brought her to you. 
Now, Abimelech had not approached her. He hadn't slept with her yet. He said, oh, Lord, will you slay people you know innocent? He himself said to me, she is my sister. And she also said, he is my brother. When I did this, my heart was blameless and my hands were clean. Abimelech is like the most innocent person you've ever met. My heart was blameless. My hands were clean, he says. Um, I'm curious, actually, even before we continue in the story, if you could just share a thought in chat about whether you, in fact, do sympathize with Abimelech or not. He didn't know the facts. What do you think? All right, so we've got an opinion that the king acted in accordance with societal customs and laws with the available facts, right? He was acting on the facts that he was given. Um, and so, that's, you know, that he did what he could with the facts that he was given. Um, I blame our father, Avimelech. Do you mean our father, Abraham, possibly? Um, or, or do you blame, mean the king, Avimelech? Um, okay, Ken says, King has a duty to make sure, given the severe consequences for the fact being otherwise, meaning don't just write, th there was actually an incident like this, a, a really um, upsetting incident recently where some, um, some celebrity was taken to task for a relationship with a minor. And he said, oh, she told me that she was 18. And basically they said, you have an obligation to like find out whether she's, you know, when a very young looking girl says I'm 18, you need to do more than just nod. You need to actually, you know, find out whether that's in fact true or not. Um, okay. Um, possibly guilty. Um, okay. Oh, a redaction of the text to honor Abraham, possibly. It was a misstatement, possibly. Um, Abraham misled him. He was lied to. Maybe he really is innocent. Okay, so basically, we've got kind of, at least according to here, according to this group here, you do mean Abraham was guilty. In general, we've got some sympathy for Abimelech. It seems like he these were the facts that he had in front of him at this particular moment, and so he acted on that. Um, let's see now um, what God has to say. Um, and God said to him in the dream, I knew that you did this with a blameless heart, and so I kept you from sinning against me. That's why I did not let you touch her. Therefore, restore the man's wife. Satan is a prophet. He will intercede for you to save your life. If you fail to restore her, know that you shall die, you and all that are yours. So God kind of gives a mixed answer. On the one hand, he says, like, oh, yeah, okay, it's true, you are innocent. But on the other hand, there's still like a very threatening tone here. Like, you really better take care of this and make it better right away. And the only way that's really going to get better is if Abraham prays for you. So it's not like God is like, oh, it was a misunderstanding, no problem. Like, there still is this, this threatening tone. Uh, I'll just finish up the story. Early the next morning, Abimelech called his servants and told them all that had happened, and the men were greatly frightened. Then Abimelech surrounded Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? What wrong have I done to you that you should bring so great a guilt on me and my kingdom? You have done to me that ought not to be done. What then, Abimelech demanded of Abraham, was your purpose in doing this thing? I thought, said Abraham, surely there's no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. So the story does give Abraham the last word, that at the end of the day, Abraham says, like, yes, you have wrong information, but I was justified in lying. I had a reason for lying. And we're going to get back to that point. Um, so what we see here in general is that um, if I could just take your answers about the punching in the face and your answers about Abimelech, you guys seem to have a lot more sympathy for um, ignorance of the facts than you do for ignorance of the law. So like if somebody doesn't know the law, they should figure it out. Because when somebody is explicitly lied to, and they, they really just had, you know, didn't, couldn't find
find out the right information, then maybe that is different. Okay, so now I want to get to finally with that long introduction, I want to get to our great debate for tonight. Um, and so the discussion that we're going to see here is from um, Tractate Makote. Tractate Makote is about um, an accidental killer. Um, in Judaism, if someone kills someone by mistake, according to the Torah, um, they, okay, first of all, according to the Torah, if someone kills someone intentionally, the punishment is death. However, if someone kills someone by mistake, the punishment is that they have to go to a city of refuge. And the idea of these cities of refuge is that there are going to be relatives who want to like avenge the blood of the person who died. Um, and so they're going to be chasing after this guy. And so the accidental killer runs to these cities of refuge um, and goes there. The rabbis, though, when they study these passages in the Torah, they understand that there are other gradations aside from intentional and accidental. For example, they think that there is a case, a possible case, of someone who is really not even at the level of accidental. Someone who is just like completely circumstances beyond their control. Picture like a cyclone picks up my house and my house goes flying through the air and it lands on top of somebody and she dies. Okay, that would be, did I kill her? Not really, it wasn't really me. It was really just circumstances completely beyond my control. And that person, the rabbis say, doesn't even have to go to the city of refuge because like everybody knows it's not his fault. Um, and rabbis also think that there's another category which is something that is between intentional and accidental. Then maybe you didn't, completely premeditatively intend to kill this person, but you did something that was so reckless and so irresponsible and so like disregarding of human life that like you're like almost a murderer. So that there's really a whole bunch of gradations when it comes to people who kill someone um, and aren't attempting to commit murder. And then we get to our discussion. And our discussion is about, I'm just gonna read the first sentence here. Um, Abaye said, one who says it is permitted. Okay, we're talking about someone who kills someone and then says it is permitted. Or as they are killing the person, they are saying it is permitted. Now, I want you to just think for a minute and try to picture what kind of scenario are we talking about here? What kind of, where could we have a case where someone actually kills someone and thinks that they are doing something that is totally permitted? How could that be? Um, okay, all right, everybody right away said the same thing that I um, also had thought of, um, which was um, the, the, okay, right, yep, 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 yep. Um, okay, war, that's an interesting one. I hadn't thought of that. Self-defense was absolutely the first thing that I thought of here, that someone maybe thought that they were killing in self-defense when in fact they were wrong that that's the scenario that maybe we're talking about. That someone, you know, I thought that he was pulling a gun on me. Um, and in fact, it turns out that he was just playing with something in his pocket and it wasn't a gun. Um, and this is, uh, somebody mentioned police brutality and this is very much something that came into my mind when I was reading this discussion is all of the conversations that are going on right now about um, police interactions with minorities and stuff like that and this idea of um, killings that sometimes um, on one end seem like they were justified possibly, and on the other end, seem like they are murder. Um, and that's possibly what this section is talking about. The interesting thing is that the Talmud um, commentators typically don't interpret it this way. 
They typically understand it um, possibly as actually meaning someone who thinks that murder is allowed, like the guy I talked about at the beginning, who like just, you know, missed the day in Hebrew school when they said that you're not supposed to punch someone in the face and missed the day that you said when they said you're not supposed to murder and he just never heard that. Um, so some of them actually think that that's what's going on here. And we'll see actually that the Talmud itself offers some interpretations and the self-defense interpretation actually doesn't come up, but it's interesting because it's the first thing that I thought of and it's the first thing that many of you thought of as well. And here's basically the debate in a nutshell. Um, I color coded this passage. I used different colors than I did the last two times and there's a reason for it, which is that the last two times the style of the debate was that somebody was like making a proposal and then they were trying other and then the Tom was trying to refute it and it was like proposal refutation proposal refutation whereas here it's just two different opinions so i just picked two different colors and it's basically just going to be abaye and rava just arguing between them um so it's less that it's sort of the defense and the offense and it's more just that it's these two sides so abaye said one who said it is permitted is a victim of circumstances beyond his control he had no idea he thought that the guy was pulling a gun on him of course what he did was completely justified he's not even culpable one little bit. He's not even an accidental killer. It's totally, totally justified what he did. Rava said to him, I say, one who says it is permitted borders on intentional murder. The opposite. It's even worse than accidental killing. It's bordering on intentional murder. It's like that middle category where it's really almost intentional murder. Um, Okay, and then sort of this neutral voice in the Talmud says, they each follow their line of reasoning. As it was stated, if he thought he was killing an animal and it was discovered that it was a person. Okay, so that's a case that's, that's also their sort of understanding of the misunderstandings of the facts. I Meaning this wasn't just a case where like, he was like aiming for a target and he missed. That would be accidental killing. This was a case where he was aiming for a target and he hit it but he thought that that target was an animal and it was in fact a person. He had the facts wrong. And in that case also, Rava says he is liable since one who says it is permitted borders on the intentional, right? So that that's the same thing that he said before, right? So this is just a consistency with his previous opinion. Rav Chista, who's sort of consistent with Abaye, says he is exempt as one who says it permitted is a victim of circumstances beyond his control. Okay, so basically that's the first part of the discussion. We've established that there are two ways of looking at one who says that it's permitted. Um, and it seems like we're talking about ignorance of the facts, right? With this example of the guy who like killed the person who he just thought was an animal. Um, Okay, now what the Talmud is going to do is it's going to go back to the discussion that we read about Avi Melech, and it's going to try to analyze this issue through the lens of the Avi Melech story. The Avi Melech story is scripture. Scripture is authoritative. So let's see what we can learn from the Avi Melech story that will help us understand the case of this guy, right? Avi Melech was someone who said it is permitted, right? He thought he was taking someone who wasn't anybody's wife. He thought it was fine. Um, and so they're going to, so both sides are going to bring, uh, try to bring proofs from the Avi Melech story. Rava raised an objection to Rav Chista, and God came to Avimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, you shall die for the woman you took, as she is a man's wife. What, is he not liable to be executed at the hand of the court? Rava, the one who thinks that someone who says it is permitted is guilty, says, look, Avimelech deserved to die, even though he didn't know the facts, God still tells him that he deserves to die. He is liable. He's guilty. Uh, this is proof for my side. But then Abaye's team, the green team, answers and says, no, he is liable at the hand of heaven. 
the language of the verses is also precise. It is as it is written from sinning against me. The exact words that God used were, oh, well, I prevented you from sinning against me. Meaning that it wasn't really, it wasn't a sin that you could be taken to court for. It was just that it was a sin to God. Um, Right. And um, so that's, I think, an interesting point, because that's being said by the green team. The green team is the one who's saying that he's exempt, right, that he's not actually punishable in any way because it was out of his control. But they're saying that even according to their opinion, he's still liable at the hands of heaven, meaning he's still morally culpable, even if we think that we can't prosecute him in any way, there still is moral guilt on this guy. Um, okay, now there's going to be just a little bit of back and forth about this from sinning against me. Um, Purple responds and says, according to your reasoning, and sin to God means only vis-a-vis -vis God and not vis-a-vis -vis man. Um, and sin to God, that line is a quote from the Joseph story. When Joseph is um, seduced by Potiphar, or almost seduced by Potiphar's wife, he says, I can't sleep with you because that would be sinning to God. Now, it obviously wouldn't just be sinning to God. It's committing adultery in the ancient world is punishable by the courts. And in fact, Joseph does get um, thrown into jail on accusations of adultery. So we know that using the phrase sinning to God doesn't actually mean that only God will punish you for it. It just means that also God will punish you for it. And rather, his judgment is given over to the ruling of man. Here, too, his judgment is given over to the ruling of man, meaning what they're really saying is Every sin is a sin to God. That just goes with the package. In addition to when I punch somebody in the face, that's also a sin to God. It has nothing to do with whether it's um, punishable in court, not punishable in court. It's just an added kind of moral weight to every sin that anybody ever commits. Um, okay, but now, there is um, now, so, so that part was Rava, the one who thinks that you should be liable, was bringing this, um, was bringing the Abimelech story. But now Abaye, the one who thinks that you're totally innocent if you don't know the facts, brings a question the other way. Abaye raised an objection to Rava. Will you slay people even though innocent? Avimelech contends in the story that he is innocent. You guys basically agreed with him, and God basically agreed with him, right? God never, right? Avimelech said that whole thing about how my heart was pure and my hands were clean, and God never said, oh, no, 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 that's not true. God seemed to accept um, the Avimelech's contention that he was innocent. So, like, that proves that someone who doesn't know the facts is innocent. That's what we can learn from this story. Um, Rava is now going to get the last word um, with a convoluted answer. So we're going to work through this slowly. Um, there, is it, it is as they responded to him. Therefore, restore the man's wife since he is a prophet. Remember, that was the quote of what God said to Avimelech, um, was he should restore the man's wife. And then he brings in the fact that Abraham is a prophet. And it seems like a total non sequitur. And Rava is basically going to read that mention of Abraham being a prophet as like a very subtle takedown of Abimelech. You think that you are so righteous and innocent, but Abraham is a prophet and he is on to you. Okay, why is that? Let's keep reading. So first of all, they point out that it is a non sequitur. Is the wife of a prophet to be returned and the wife of one who is not a prophet not to be returned? Obviously not. Meaning this is a totally irrelevant fact. Why are we bringing it in? Rather, it is as Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says that Rabbi Yonatan says, this is what God is saying to him. Therefore, restore the man's wife in any case. And as for that which you have said, will you slay people even though innocent? He himself said to me, she is my sister. Right, that whole thing where you were arguing that you're so innocent, he is a prophet and it is from you he learned. He knows what you're really up to. When a stranger comes to the city, 
One asks him about matters of eating and drinking. Does one ask him, is that your wife? Is that your sister? As soon as God says to Abimelech, as soon as Abraham walked into your town, something was fishy. Normally, when you walk into a normal town, people say to you, do you have a place to sleep? Do you have a place to eat? Can I offer to show you around? And when Abraham walked into your town, Avimelech, the first thing anybody said to him was, ooh, who's that pretty woman? Is she your wife? Is she your sister? He knew that there was something that was not okay here. And he knew, he knew that this was a system that was going to exploit him. And if you set up a system that is going to exploit people, then you can expect that people are going to lie to you. Um, as I was preparing this passage, I was thinking about an article that I read um, years ago about, um, you remember those Nigerian prince schemes where like somebody writes you about how like I'm a prince from Nigeria and I have like, you know, a hundred million dollars, but I can't get at my bank account. And like, if you just send me a thousand dollars, then like, I'll give you half of it. Uh, and the article was analyzing who were the people who fell for those schemes. Um, and one of the things that it argued in the article was that a lot of people who got caught up in these schemes were people who were themselves somewhat dishonest. Um, and it basically suggested that if you're an honest person and you read that, then you're like, no, 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 that's not how it works. Like the way that you get $10 million is not by sending, it's by earning it, it's by working, it's by, you know, something that is more sort of legitimate um, and that, that there's no like shortcut to getting $10 million. Whereas someone who's already like kind of interested in getting quick schemes and interested in kind of tricks and shortcuts and stuff like that, that that's the person who's going to be taken in. Um, and, and that's my sense of what Rava is saying here is instead of thinking about, oh, he didn't have the facts. He's saying, let's think about why this person is ignorant of the facts. And in fact, the reason that he's ignorant about the facts is itself a problem. Yes, Abimelech was explicitly lied to, but Rava says that it's still his fault because he created a system in which it was dangerous to your life to tell the truth. And then he gets mad that people lie to him. Like, that's terrible. That's totally unfair. You need to think about the background. You can't just think about the foreground of Abraham lied to me. How could he do that? You got to think about what the whole system is that is leading to that lie. Um, and how many ways it is corrupt. Okay, now the passage ends with a weird sentence. Um, it ends with a conclusion. And the conclusion is, from here, we conclude that a descendant of Noah, meaning a descendant of Noah, Noah is the descendant of everybody in the world. So a descendant of Noah just means a person typically who is not Jewish, um, is executed, is held, li they are held liable as he should have learned and he did not learn. Okay. I am curious what you think that last line is about. He should have learned and he did not learn. What is the thing that someone should learn and they are liable if they don't learn? Any thoughts in chat? To it. Oh, actually, I'll get back to that afterwards. Um, to listen, Rachel says. Interesting. Um, right, the word learn, I find very interesting here because, right, so now the comments are coming in. Um, to listen and to think. Um, use their eyes to see and ears to hear. 
Um, nice. Um, I, I think the word learn is a really interesting word here that they're finishing the discussion with. I'm just going to stop the share. Um, one sec. Okay. Um, which, because especially because typically when I think of learning, I think of kind of learning the law, um, and that that maybe this is about also ignorance of the law. And I think that to some extent, the rabbis actually, right? We we were like much less forgiving of the person who didn't know the law, and more forgiving of the person who didn't know the facts. And I think for the rabbis, there's maybe not a difference. Ignorance of the law and ignorance of the facts are both inexcusable. Um, and both of them, you should learn. Whether it's you should learn the law or it's you should learn to look around you, to listen, to figure out what's going on, to hear what other people actually have to say, you know, and not just what they're saying on the surface, but what's going on behind that. Um, and that's that someone who thinks that it's okay to kill because they didn't know that murder was forbidden and someone who thinks that it's okay to kill because they you know thought it was an animal or something are both guilty of the same thing that both of them should have learned and didn't learn um, and that it's kind of i think the message at the end is that it's not enough to not intend to do harm to others but that we have to actively learn and actively work on avoiding harming each other and we have to learn the laws we have to learn the facts and i think that as we um, are approaching i'm going to wrap this up so that there's a few minutes for questions as we're approaching our last session together um, i think that the end of this passage is kind of a fitting conclusion that we have a moral um, obligation to always be learning, um, whether it's traditional learning or just learning about the world around us and listening and seeing um, and understanding what is going on. And we have to always continue to educate and inform ourselves. Um, so I want to, um, I'm happy to take questions for a few minutes now. There were a couple things that I already saw in chat that I thought were interesting, but also if people want to throw in more. Um, okay. Um, a couple, a theme that came up in a couple of questions, and feel free, oh yes, Elaine just said it also, is the female voice and its absence in all of this. Um, this is a story about two men, the, the Avi Melech story is a story about two men fighting over a woman where she seems much more like an object than like a subject. Um, she does speak in the story, not directly, but Avimelech says, oh, she also said that he's my brother, um, but, um, but we don't really have any sense of how she feels about the whole thing. Um, and even just the fact that like him taking her to his palace, the only thing that's potentially wrong with that is that she might belong to somebody else. Um, and that if she doesn't belong to somebody else, then like, of course, it's fine for her to like be grabbed and taken to the king's palace, whether she wants to or not. Um, so I think that that is definitely um, a, an unexplored problem in the story, that the story is, is definitely told from a male perspective. And we really, we really just don't know what Sarah thinks about any of this. We can kind of imagine through our modern eyes that Sarah might not be thrilled about any of this, either the, you know, the positive or the negative, um, you know, either when she's taken or when she's like handed back to Abraham. I don't know if she's happy with any of it, um, but it's very hard for us to get into the head of someone from this, you know, ancient world with such a different um, perspective on women's roles. Um, how different do you think the Talmud would be if it were written more recently? Oh my gosh, that is a fascinating question. I love it. Um, wow. I mean, look, there are, you know, commentaries on the Talmud and stuff like that that are being written all the time. There are, you know, sort of Talmudic style things written all the time. And it so depends, you know, it depends who's writing it um, more recently um, and kind of what are their influences. And there are just so many different factors. I, I think it's really fascinating. Um, but uh, I think we could imagine a lot of different Talmuds being written more recently that would be very different from each other. Um, okay, um, just uh, Marcy's question about um, ignorance of Shabbat observance. Um, so 
I didn't even get into, but there's a whole interesting history to the Talmudic passage that I brought you about the child who's taken captive among the Gentiles, which is that that actually becomes um, kind of part of um, religious um, Orthodox rabbis discussion of secular Jews in the um, 19th and 20th century, um, where they sort of understand that kind of maybe we can look at anyone who is um, a secular Jew who grew up not being taught to um, observe Shabbat the way that we think that Shabbat should be observed. Um, and maybe all of those people can be considered kind of comparable to this like child who was taken captive among the Gentiles. So like, even though it seems like this like very fantastical scenario, it actually is a scenario that um, sort of is, is interpreted in modern times as applying also to, um, to kind of regular everyday things that happen. Um, and, and, and it's a way when they do that, it's a way of saying that we, we should be sympathetic to people who were brought up differently from us, that even though they, um, you know, even though they didn't, um, you know, even though they're not observing the law the way that we would prefer that they observe the law, they still are, you know, it's not really their fault and we should be um, respectful of them and forgiving of them.